Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, our trade war update, new tariffs and effect against China. But is there light at the end of the tunnel? Plus, an update on that hemp story we told you about last week. Mississippi's Ag Commissioner weighs in. In Southern Gardening, summer may be winding down, but things are still hot. And in our feature story, though, beef is definitely what's for dinner. All those hides from the herd are turning to bovine blight. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. The trade war with China has narrowed the trade gap somewhat, but the fallout has been a cut to farm income. The Nebraska Farm Bureau, for example, estimates the state's farmers will lose nearly a billion dollars this year, and they're not alone. Peter Tubbs has more. American consumers began paying a 15% tariff on 113 billion worth of consumer goods that are manufactured in China. Even as the trade war ratcheted up, both sides agreed to another round of talks. With tax 122.06. The new American tariffs cover 3,200 product categories manufactured in China and affect items ranging from smartwatches and flat panel televisions to virtually all clothing and footwear. The American consumer has largely escaped paying tariffs on imports from China, but that has now changed. 69% of the consumer goods imported from China are now tariffed. If the additional threatened tariffs take effect in December, 550 billion in Chinese imports will have an additional tax. China retaliated with 75 billion worth of tariffs on goods originating in the United States. These duties cover agricultural products like fish, nuts, and barley, as well as certain metals and chemicals used in manufacturing. Some analysts believe the now 14-month-long trade struggle has pushed both the American and global economy closer to a recession. The two sides have agreed to resume discussions in October. The meeting will be the 13th round of trade talks. The USDA believes the first round of market facilitation payments are hitting producers' mailboxes. The payments, intended by the White House to offset the impact of tariffs on American commodities, doled out $12 billion in support in 2018 and may spend as much as $16 billion in 2019. Uh, last year, I gave the farmers $16 billion out of tariffs. The year before that, because they were targeted by China. The year before that, I gave our farmers $12 billion. And the way we figured that, I said, how badly have our farmers been hit by targeting from China? And I was told they were hit to the tune of $16 billion and I made up that $16 dollar for dollar to the farmers. So the farmers are extremely happy, and they also know, and they're warriors, they also know we have to do this with China. We can't let this go on. So the trade war continues. More talks are on the table. In the meantime, according to Politico, China seems to be floating an offer ahead of those talks to buy some amount of U.S. agricultural products. If this sounds familiar, it is. China has floated offers before, usually tied to delaying U.S. tariff action. The next round of tariffs is set for December 15th. Those duties will likely cover anything not already under a tariff schedule. Meanwhile, Congress is back from August recess, and there's a long list to keep an eye on. The new fiscal year starts on October 1st. The government has until then to avert yet another shutdown, though it looks like funding will be approved to cover expenses until the end of the year. Both parties would like to have the USMCA ratified. That could happen this month. The Japanese trade deal still needs hammering out, and Trade Aid 2.0 is still in progress. The ethanol backlash is another issue being watched carefully by corn growers and refineries. As we mentioned last week, the president's approval of 31 RFS waivers sparked strong reaction, and the president seems to be looking for a compromise. So far, no luck in that arena. In the meantime, Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley made clear his feelings on the matter. Iowa by far the top ethanol-producing state. 
He tweeted this a few days ago, quote, rumors floating around town about some ethanol announcement to counteract the disaster of EPA 31 small refinery waivers. If rumors true, this would be yet another disaster for ethanol and corn growers and would be bad politically for Republicans. Big oil strikes again. Despite several reports to the contrary, Mississippi has not backed away from its ban on labeling non-meat foods as meat. In a statement, Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson said the state would continue its rulemaking process to enforce the law despite a lawsuit in July. He also said the term veggie burger was never out loud, uh, outlawed by the Mississippi law or other proposed rules and that it appears the plaintiff in that case will drop the suit. Gibson maintains the law is constitutional and will work to enforce it. The war on African swine fever overseas continues. Vietnam has culled nearly 5 million hogs in an attempt to control an outbreak there. Reuters reports that ASF has spread to all 63 provinces in that country. Vietnam's herd is down nearly 20 percent to just over 22 million pigs. The pork industry there is valued at around $4 billion. There is still no vaccine for the disease. More on that hemp story we told you about last week. You may recall that in January, a shipment of hemp grown in Oregon was headed for processing in Colorado by way of Idaho. The truck and its $1.4 million cargo was impounded after a routine stop. Idaho saying hemp is still illegal in the state, though in the 2018 Farm Bill it is no longer described as a controlled substance. Idaho still has the truck and cargo and a criminal case is pending against a driver. Mississippi is one of several states with a task force studying hemp and its potential as a crop. Cannabis has been studied for decades at the University of Mississippi. I asked Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson, the chairman of that task force, about the legal conflict. It may not be a controlled substance under federal law, but uh, we have a set of state laws and regulations that sometimes are consistent with, usually are consistent with the federal law. Sometimes we're a little more strict or otherwise. And in Mississippi, under state law, uh, hemp still is a controlled substance. So you have a conflict between federal law and state law. Now, here in this case, it sounds like they were uh, the calling for federal preemption, more or less, of the state law. That's just not the way it works. If states have jurisdiction and the states decide the rules, uh, you've seen a lot of that uh, uh, in other areas, uh, drug policy and so forth. But uh, the federal law is still being developed in terms of rules to be promulgated by the USDA. So we're far from a clear answer on a lot of these issues, for example, like transportation. Ultimately, Gibson says there are multiple angles to the hemp question. He told me the task force, which includes 13 members of offices from the governor to the commissioner of public safety, is being very deliberate on the issue. One primary concern appears to be hemp's relationship to cannabis. Bottom line is that the risk of the, the growing hemp uh, to the law enforcement community is that it could be used as sort of a camouflage for illegal marijuana products. So uh, what states like Kentucky have done is gone through background checks for folks who are growing it, uh, having clear GPS coordinates and, and communicating that to the law enforcement so there's no confusion of that, that, that this is a marijuana crop. In fact, it's hemp. And so I think with a proper regulatory framework, I, I think it's certainly doable in the state of Mississippi. Uh, at the end of the day, our task force will review all this information and make some recommendations to the legislature for the coming session. The next meeting of the Mississippi Hemp Cultivation Task Force is September 25th. If you'd like to know more about that or watch a video recording of the last meeting, visit the Ag Commission online at mdac.ms.gov. Look for the task force link on the right side of the page. On the lighter side, once again, are you bummed out because your garden is burned out from the summer heat? Here's horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with a plant that can take all the heat summer can dish out and give a little back. I have to admit that in late summer when the heat is on, my favorite garden plants are peppers. 
the ornamental variety. They stand up to the temperatures when other plants are wilting away. What I love about ornamental peppers is the variety available. They're big or small, have colorful foliage, and feature a kaleidoscope of fruit colors all at the same time on each plant. Chili Chili Ornamental Peppers, a 2002 All-America Selections winner, have wildly colored, upward-pointing attractive fruit. The fruit changes color from yellow to orange and matures at red. Extremely heat tolerant, and unlike other ornamental peppers, chili chili fruit are not hot. Purple Flash Ornamental Pepper is one of the showiest available and was named a Mississippi Medallion winner in 2010. The purple and white variegated leaves are promptly seen from across the garden. The attractive fruit starts as dark purple marbles and matures to a bright red color. The variety Sangria holds its slender fruit pointing upward boastfully as if getting ready for a party. This pretty ornamental pepper bears fruit that resembles confetti. Young fruit emerge greenish yellow and then march through a wonderful parade of colors, orange, purple, and finally onto a glorious red. A question I frequently get is, are the fruit of ornamental peppers edible? Well, the answer is yes, but just remember that most are fiery hot. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. <laughs> In an abbreviated market segment, the hot topic is corn. Analyst Jeff French says demand is gutted. And while some are content to simply look ahead to next season's crop, others are still amazed that projections are as high as 94 million acres. Here's Jeff on that pipeline number. The focus right now of the market is for the, this new crop because uh, we don't know what's out there. I mean, we, we've seen some guesstimates and, and, you know, we've seen some surveys, but, uh, you know, right now, 90 million acres of corn, uh, we'll see. Uh, the USDA has us at 91% uh, harvested. Uh, I think that's a very aggressive number considering, uh, you know, the late year that we had in 1993, we harvest, harvested 86% of uh, planted acres. So we could lose some acres just from not harvesting them, but uh, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna find out a lot here moving forward once the combines start rolling. Time now for today's trivia quiz. As negotiators hope for a trade deal with China, they're pushing harder than ever. In the meantime, to make NAFTA 2.0 a done deal, soon to be called the USMCA, NAFTA represents billions of dollars worth of goods flowing between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Today's question, how are most NAFTA goods transported? Is the answer A, by boat, B, truck, C, jet, or D, by prop airplane? We'll have the answer coming up. We'll take a short break, but coming up, beef demand up, leather demand down. Yep, you heard right. At a time when beef is definitely what's for dinner, all those hides from the herd are turning to bovine blight. For centuries, leather has been the choice for boots, bags, and ways to bundle up. At times, they're changing, and those tanned hides are competing with faux leather and cheap labor. So what's take two at the tanneries? Find out, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, the always popular Mississippi Gourd Festival, Friday and Saturday, September 20th and 21st at the Smith County Ag Complex in Raleigh, Mississippi. This two-day festival includes several gourd crafting classes and artists from around the country will be there too. Cost is $2, parking is free. For more information, call Mike Thompson at 601 374-0245.
Next, it's Breakfast on the Farm, October 17th through 19th from 9 to noon at the Bearden Dairy Center at MSU in Starkville. Learn where your food comes from, milk a cow, tour the dairy. The first two days are for student field trips. The 19th, that's a Saturday, is open to the public. Registration opens soon. For more info, call Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. In the cattle industry, many still talking about the Tyson fire in Kansas and the market reaction ever since. Ag economist Josh Maples has been watching those numbers. We sat down and talked about that reaction. Josh, the beef markets are continuing to react after that Tyson fire in Kansas. Now that a little bit of time has passed, what are prices actually saying? So that's right, Mike. We've, we've got some, some observations or some price reports coming after the fire. Uh, what we've seen looking in Mississippi, feeder cattle prices down 5 to 10 percent depending on the weight class. And they're still down, even three, four weeks later. Uh, you look at what the feeder cattle futures market's done, it dropped 5% in the first week after the fire, and we're still about 5% lower. Same story on live cattle, down about 8%, and we're still down significantly. The interesting piece to look at is really the other side of the processor. You know, the cattle is the input to the processor, the beef is the output, right? And so we saw beef prices or boxed beef price cutout value surge right after the fire. Um, and they went up eight and a half, nine percent. They've come back down a little bit, but they're still significantly higher. So what this has done is created a big margin for the remaining processors out there, lower input prices and higher output prices. Unfortunately, we haven't seen cattle prices come back up. So uh, I think that's kind of what we're looking at going forward, we're, we're going to see the margins continue to shrink. Um, but when cattle prices are going to come back, it, it seems like it may take a little bit more time. Back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up. One of our biggest trade deals is NAFTA 2.0, otherwise known as the USMCA. The president is hoping to get that deal ratified as soon as possible. It will be a signature deal for him, and that deal will help level the playing field with Canada and Mexico. Today's question was, how are most NAFTA goods transported? Is the answer by boat, truck, jet, or prop airplane? According to the Department of Transportation, about two-thirds of the 90 billion or so dollars in trade with Mexico and Canada is done through trucking. So if you picked B, you picked the right answer. For most of American history, leather has played a critical role thanks to its durability and good looks. And more than one farmer has relied on a good pair of boots to get through a workday. But more recently, leather sales have declined as faux leather products have pushed to the front of the pack. Here's Colleen Bradford Krantz with that story. Historians believe tanneries, where craftsmen turned animal hides into leather, first appeared at least 5,000 years ago in villages in the Middle East. Today, communities still gather together workers, such as these in Pennsylvania, to process cattle and other livestock hides using methods not so different from those used by their hunter-gatherer forefathers. The tanning industry is, is one of the oldest industries in the world. It's a direct byproduct of the meat industry, right? And so as we harvest animals for meat, just like the Native Americans, we try to utilize all of the components of the, of the animal. And so that skin is about six to 10 percent of the animal weight. And so if we can capture that and use that for other products, that helps keep it out of landfill. But tanneries are becoming increasingly rare. While colonial America had a tannery in nearly every town, these businesses have been rapidly disappearing. The number of U.S. tanneries with 50 or more employees dropped from 86 in 1993 to just 22 in 2016. According to the federal government, water treatment and other improvements to protect human health and the environment were costly for some tanneries. Many closed while others relocated to countries with lower cost labor. 
More recently, international disputes and the growth in synthetic materials have also hurt the industry. Leather is a natural product. It's breathable, it's flexible, it wears over time. Uh, with synthetics, they're typically petroleum-based, which is a finite resource. The tanneries that have survived have done so largely through specialization or a focus on exporting. Tim Ng is the director of West Des Moines, Iowa-based CK International, which buys and sells pigskins internationally. Pigskin accounts for only about 10 percent of the world's leather. CK International helps connect U.S. packing plants with buyers of pigskin, mostly in Asia, who then use the leather in other products. The majority of leather is made from cattle hides and used in shoes and boots, but automobile and furniture use remain significant. Over 90 percent of cattle hides produced in the U.S. are exported, China being a key buyer. The industry exported a total of $1.6 billion worth of hide, skin, and leather in 2018. Yet this was one of the industry's lowest export values since the 2009 recession. And prices for hides remain low. Still, Ng is optimistic. As we have more transparency into where products come from and as consumers demand that, um, I think the industry is really positioning themselves well to kind of be in play and have be part of that discussion. In Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania, the leather tannery Wicket and Craig brought dozens of jobs to town when the now 152-year-old company moved there from Toronto, Canada in 1989. It still employs about 90 people in the town of 2,500 and is one of just a few large U.S. tanneries remaining that use plant-based compounds, known as vegetable tannins, on the leather. Most use chromium tanning, a method introduced in the 1850s and viewed as the most efficient processing method. There is a small risk, if exposed to extremely high temperatures, that chromium can convert into a type known to be a carcinogen. U.S. regulations, however, govern proper disposal and water treatment for all tanneries. Vegetable tanning is the oldest form of tanning. It all comes from, from tree bark extract. Those trees are grown for the tanning industry. And while the chromium tanneries can process a hide into leather in a week, vegetable tanneries require six to eight weeks from start to finish. When you get a pallet of hides in, you have no idea what you have there. We've tried to turn it as much into a science so that we can be consistent. I mean, the cattle are never going to be consistent. Those are variables that every tanner has to deal with. The Wicket and Craig Leather Factory processes nearly 5,000 cattle hides a month, most from Charlay, Simmental, and Limousine cattle because of the lighter colored hides. Cattle brands and any other imperfections on the hide reduce the value. Most of them come from the Dakotas, or we get them from the Toronto, uh, that eastern, eastern Canada region. So the farther north you go, generally the better the hides are because there's less summer, and hence the less bug bites, less, less scratching, and things like that. Bressler says the chromium tanned leathers tend to serve the automotive and garment industries, while Wicket and Craig might have their thicker leather used in equestrian equipment gun holsters, and handbags. Bressler says most Americans fail to appreciate the quality of work done in the U.S., regardless of tanning method. They think genuine leather is genuine leather, and why should they pay 12 or uh, 40 50 $60 for a genuine leather belt that the leather came from Wicket and Craig when they can buy one at, at Walmart for $12.95? It's all about education in a way. And they're, they're getting better. Why uh, our product is superior, why our customers' products are superior, that's important. Some of us still love leather. There's just something about it. Well, next week on the show, a story that could start with a joke, but trust me, this is no laughing matter. One man says it could be a national security issue. We're in Pennsylvania, a state that produces all by itself two-thirds of the entire American mushroom supply. In fact, one county calls itself the mushroom capital of the world. 
There's a lot more to this industry than meets the eye, though. We're going to go behind the scenes next time on Farm Week. Before we go, a heartwarming story. It's not an ag story, but definitely deserves some airtime. Long story short, an elementary school in Florida was participating in College Colors Day. One student designed with very few resources of his own a University of Tennessee shirt. But when he wore it to school, some other students bullied him because of it, and he was devastated. The teacher you see here asked if anyone had any connections to UT. The school got wind of it and sent a whole box of UT swag, and the boy became a hero to his classmates. Then the school used his design to make an official UT shirt with his design on it. The proceeds to go to the national group Stomp Out Bullying. The whole world got wind of it and so many people ordered the shirt that it crashed the school's server temporarily. By the way, UT's server system is back up and running smoothly if you'd like to get a shirt of your own. Remember, the proceeds go to charity. Anyway, great story. My shirt is on the way. Kudos to that young man and to his caring teacher, Laura Snyder, and to the University of Tennessee. Job very well done. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching.